<laughs> yeah, I just turned it on. I mean, oh, that was so embarrassing yeah. last. I was like, come on, really? <laughs> Are we, yeah. are, we, are we really doing this? I said, oh, man, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. All right, let's get into this. Blow mm -hmm. my screen up. And so maybe we'll have some more people come in. Hopefully, we'll Yeah, uh, Lorena and uh, your ex-wife are not going to be here? Yeah, uh, I, I sent them a text. Mm -hmm. Let them know. I talked to them earlier in the week and, and told them uh, what would be going on. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that Delisa normally has to go to the doctor, some medical stuff going on now. Mm -hmm. But um, I outreach to both of them. So if they come in, we'll have this recording anyway. And yeah. we'll just okay. go from there. Actually, it's a good thing. I want Zawadi to pay attention, look and to understand the logic behind this. Okay, will do. Mm hmm Welcome, welcome once again to this fourth edition of the Triple O Podcast. I am your host for the evening, James Osler. I have my wonderful colleague, Dr. Philip Masila Muticia, his son, the magnificent artist, Lawadi, with us tonight. We're anticipating some more folks coming our way. This is a virtual part two that really started last week when we began discussing funding underlying all the various projects that people were sharing. Again, Triple O is the conglomeration of Osler Studios Incorporated, Osler University, and Osler Academy Online, which is our homeschool project. So the introduction of our guests and visitors, and we will turn over the mic first to Dr. Maticia. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and we're going to talk about funding this evening, and then Zawadi. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah. Yes, I am Philip Masila Muticia, Professor of Education, North Carolina Central University. Been teaching in, in higher education over 38 years now. And, uh, and I am also uh, the founder of the Diaspora Outreach Development Foundation which we had launched recently and now is radio operational, which raised to raise funds to uh, support projects, programs, products, services in community-based development initiatives, and with including the for, both for profit and non-for-profit, which is also uh, engaging humanitarian services to sustain communities. Yeah, I'm looking forward for this, and uh, we will have a, a good dialogue, which is uh, my main main focus is uh, on uh, uh, training on civic education literacy and transforming communities and sustaining and the dialogue for peace capacity building. Wonderful. Thank you once again. Wonderful to have such a wonderful mentor. Awesome man of vision, global traveler, expertise in multiple areas, and instruction, and wonderful to have you once again. And now we have our resident artist, Zawadi. So you want to go ahead and take the mic and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Zawadi Mutizia. I am an artist who has worked in the animation industry for a little over seven years, and I attended the Savannah College of Art and Design for digital art, and I'm currently looking for ways to expand my career. Thank awesome, you for having me. Awesome, awesome. Wonderful. I, I never heard him in such a good voice, the one natural voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. Like you, the, and um, Osler. Thank well, you. I'm James Osler. Once again, this is the Triple O Podcast, retired full professor with expertise in statistics, e-learning, instructional design, animation, art, visual design. And tonight we are going to talk about proposal writing. We have amongst our key value listeners tonight, a connection to get massive funding to do projects, not only here, but on the continent and abroad. But one of the big things that came up last week as we were talking about extending your voice and seeing and mm -hmm. speaking into reality and trying your best to bring about a change entrepreneurially, innovatively, inventively, 
What's funding? Well, having a funding source is great, but there are certain parameters that you have to go through in order to acquire that funding. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. So the template was given to us to meet this particular funding source by Dr. Maticia, but we want to go down to the minutia tonight to talk about constructing the proposal, what it's comprised of, what are the key elements that you need in it, whether you're seeking entrepreneurial focus funding from industry partners, whether you're seeking federal funding, such as grants, whether you're seeking enterprise and organizational funding for perhaps a larger organization, such as the UN. They have particular models in their request for proposals, acronym RFP, that typically comes out, that state the rationale and scope around which the target audience that the funder wants you to address. Now that's speaking of non-innovative things in the camp of this is the funder, government, institution, organization, bank, enterprise, and these are the persons they want to help. And how do you meet the scope of that? On the other end is having an entrepreneurial area that addresses universally, such as education, health, society that is providing your expertise that the funder can actually meet. And that's what we want to talk about. So this is episode four of the Triple O broadcast, and let's get started. Our title for this evening is Under Completing Our Divine Purpose and Destiny, the topic, Your Proposal for Funding. Your Proposal for Funding. Everything starts with a project proposal. And once you have that project proposal clearly laid out, you address key areas under certain inquiries that state and provide your project in a way that others will want to fund it. And that's what we're going to address this evening, your proposal for funding. The key project proposal areas. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. Most persons, when they get into proposal writing, are overwhelmed with the process. They're overwhelmed because even if they're a great writer, they're out of their particular expertise and ballywick of how to seek funding. But if you look at these six key inquiry informatic areas, it helps you to better become a proposal writer. And once that relationship is built with an agency and you have that existing success, they're going to continue to fund that person. Because number one, the project is going to meet the scope of what they said they're going to do. It's going to address the target audience to do what they want. They're not going to abuse the monies. They're going to use them in the way and fashion in which they stated. They're going to have deliverable areas. It's going to make their agency or area look great, which has supplied the funds. And once the project timetable is done, then things can be closed out and you can move forward in new vistas and new areas. So again, keep in mind, if you address the proposal, without angst from these areas, who, what, when, where, why, and how, and wrap them succinctly inside and contextually with relevance inside your proposal, you are going to get funded. Someone's gonna seek you out or if you're seeking a particular project. And then once you have success, it just keeps going on and on and on. And the monies get bigger and you're able to do the scope in different areas. I've been a part of grant writing for some time now. I've done small ones, large ones, massive ones. Interestingly enough, uh, Dr. Matissius Frat Brother, who was my mentor, uh, engaged me in not getting in a part of that because I was more in the instructional area. But down the line, when you are a professor and you have a well-rounded career, you are going to address some type 
a project that you're going to be a part of, especially as a leader in your field. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. Our first key topic area. What is the who all about? The who, a project proposal writer. So the who really begins to deal with two separate aspects that need to be covered. Number one, who are your organization or, or your industry partners, including the funder? And number two, the most important, exactly who is the target audience that you are going to be serving during the timetable of the project? So if you're on your own, then obviously you don't have partners, but who is it you're serving? And that wraps around why there's a need in that area for that project to take place. And you'll be surprised at how funds are thrown at different projects. I remember former pre uh, President Ronald Reagan just being disgusted at a project that was funded on how blueberries affected crayfish. Yes, it can go out there as, as crazy as that. And he pulled that particular one. So there's funding already floating around and much like scholarships, billions of it, and we're in the age of trillions, are left on the table, especially in these United States. Most funding applications, and you should study when you get in the area of acquiring monies for what you want to do. You can take your skill set and abridge it to anything, especially as a creator, as uh, Zawadi and I are. It's just a matter of what you want to do and what the particular funder is seeking. The key is, in our word, the rationale. How do you articulate logically the need so that the funds can address whatever it is that needs to be done towards that target audience? I'll give you a great for instance. You may be a mural, a, a mural painter. Your speciality is doing 12 to 25 foot paintings. You may want to do a project in a particular city. You can look at the request for proposals that are out there or create your own that talks about bringing diverse communities together and community partners and sharing them on several of the buildings in the city to promote the overall success of the city, bringing people together, addressing diversity, addressing and highlighting key points in the city key areas that could be that the murals is going to do more than one over a, a set time can be used for art projects for students who, who can either see or participate you can highlight as a travel destination and highlighting the, the various areas of the city that people never thought about you just got to provide the rationale for it and then you may work with the art council of the city they may be one of your agencies or partners you've worked with before who can engage you in the process. I've seen filmmakers do this with success so many times for so many documentaries and things of that nature. Because by its very nature, film cannot occur without money. They need money for crews. They need money for set designs, technology, editing, audio, audio all the things we think about. So they have to have a compelling rationale to do that project. And that's how Ken Burns, starting with the Burns Effect, did a lot of the history projects that he did, starting with, uh, he started with baseball, I believe. Then he went to the Civil War. Then he went to the national parks. And every few years, he's doing a different one. And he perfected the Ken's Burns effect, Ken Burns Effect of visually looking at a photo, placing it in a space and film, exploring that with narrative, and, and the narrative explaining the photograph while showing key things in that technology. And that became known as the Burns effect. But he did that through proposals. A lot of his were funded by PBS, uh, National Arts Foundation, things of that nature. Same thing. So you need to first establish who is the population that you're going to be served. 
if there's a deficit there, uh, I use in this particular presentation tonight a reading program as an example. I remember doing a chess, one to teach the logics of chess and strategy uh, as a minor uh, funded program at NCCU. And I did a larger one for uh, persons who are seeking to go back into the work world who may have had um, needed narcotics intervention. And we did that multi-million dollar product with, uh, project with SAMHSA for four years from 2012 to 2016. So there's all types of ways that you can fluidly bend the proposal to what you want to do. You just have to have a compelling argument. And it starts with the who and who is the population that you're going to be serving. Most funding applications will have a section that we mentioned on the, on the applicant's background. This is where you can place your curriculum vita, larger than a, uh, a resume, which details and highlights your expertise, your accomplishments, things that are so vital to the rationale to show why you're doing what you're doing. So if we take Zawadi for an example, with him having this background in animation, and if he were to do a project on whatever, say with the city or North Carolina or whatever his interests are, then his CV or his resume, so to speak, curriculum vita means life curriculum, we use that in education, would highlight all of his expertise. And when the rationale, they read that and find out, oh, wow, this guy's amazing. He did all of these things that, it, that increases your likelihood of getting the funds for what you want to do. If you are an industry, enterprise or an organization, then you need to provide in-depth information on the organization's history through a brief, succinct history. Now, this is considering if you're not writing your own proposal, you are seeking funding from, say, sticking with our National Arts Council or the Arts Council of the city. They may have a proposal that you have to fit your expertise and rationale into to have that particular event take place. So if you're in an organization and, and say you're a consortium, could be between you, university, business, sticking with my art motif, multiple artists. Um, I remember in New York, uh, Kerouac and some of the writers creating things like this and going on the road to travel in the 50s and 60s. And then there was uh, the Bohemian movement, both in Germany and here in the United States at different time periods, and what they were doing. Scientists even did it. And they rewrapped that around scientific endeavors that tied to government, military or non-military, and the funding that went through from there. So you want to provide background history if you're an industry or a consortia or an association with expertise and you're describing in detail your management structure, your previous experience through some other successful programs um, that, has been, that have been run and stating the overall organizational purpose. And when those are done succinctly but descriptively, funders love to award other organizations that have a history of success. Once you've done something successfully, they want to reward you with more funding. In particular, if you are a part of another organization. Organizations love to shake hands with other organizations. Then if you have fundamental key partners, say in government or in the community in which you're approaching, educators, if you're in education, uh, professors, if you're in the ivory tower, or partners with expertise in the area that have a history of su sustained success, that will help you in getting funding. And the last paragraph, this section of your proposal should especially cover the aspects of the targeted group, again, the one that you want to serve. What are the target population's characteristics, such as its demographics? the culture associated with that demographic, educational aspects, if there are any, any and all challenges 
towards the success of the project or as a part of the rationale for doing the project in the first place. What sets the target of population out at large from the general population? And why do they have a need to be served? Why is it deemed necessary for funding and the implementation of the project? And how will it change things? These are the things to consider when you're looking at the who. So I'm gonna stop right now before we go anywhere else and stop and share and see if we wanna have any discussions about the who. And the mic is open. Zawadi, Dr. Matissi, any comments? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, we have to uh, have a plan with the foundation, which incorporate, we use the who, the five W's, and then identify the talent and the uh, developed organization whereby it's going to create the, the, the define the projects, program for, uh, and products and the services, and then personnel. Because most of the people write a proposal, but they do not factor that as a job. To, they are doing work in to produce funds to pay for themselves, as well as raising fund, funds to, sub, to support the project which should produce money. This is the, the, the angle which I'm interested in, and the DODFI is interested in and identify pro programs in communities and projects and, and then design that way. And then when we, we have our chief consultant who is connected with the funding, banks and the foundation entrepreneurship, who has a model, it's called CLM model, which we will, she will provide training and then help us uh, construct, develop, design a program which becomes almost an institution and in uh, impacting community, uh, so, you know, local, and na national, and international, and especially in the low uh, socioeconomic uh, community. Yeah, yeah, who well, are underserved communities. Zawali, so, I want to hear from you. Is there yeah. a particular target audience or anyone? that you can think of that you would like to work with or serve or any type of engagement when you think about a who with your skill sets that you'd be interested in working with? Um, well, I've always felt that um, working in fields with children's books and um, animated shows for, for children as well is always, uh, especially educational, um, has always been a great perspective and a, a good group to to keep up um, lots of projects, especially for funding uh, with, with structures like these. You know, that's how in 69, with the uh, the children's uh, workshop, that three fundamental programs to my youth um, started. One was um, Zoom, which is no longer on with the striped shirts. Uh, the other that came on before Zoom was Sesame Street. So uh, Henson had his Muppets and was a puppeteer, had been working in commercials mm -hmm. and saw PBS is right here down the street from us here in North Carolina, but mm -hmm. um, saw a major area for children's workshops and riding on the coat of that was Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. So all of um, them in separate ways got together and proposed different sections of the time that they could educate children, incorporating animation, music, uh, all of these different things. Some of them came out of commercials. And that's what led for years to things that later came out like Schoolhouse Rock, pure animation. <laughs> that one happened because he was inspired by what he saw with PBS and the things that were going on that led to other Saturday morning commercial activities, such as, uh, uh, who am I thinking about? Uh, uh, Land of the Lost, all these different things that were going out. But then commercials came in, because that was a great time to sell breakfast cereal, sugar, <laughs> children. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what happened was, one of the guys who was an advertiser was upset because his son didn't know his times tables, and he could sing every song that was uh, on the radio. 
So mm -hmm. he got together with his friends in advertising, and that's how Schoolhouse Rock came along. Pure animation. That eventually would lead to, during that time, um, the shorts that were done in the Hollywood industry, reinvesting those, though they were, some of them were hyperviolent. They were never meant for children. But that is how you got Looney Tunes and all of that. Those shorts, they went back in, pulled Chuck Jones and all those animators back out, shortened the shorts to make structure for television shows for TV. So I watched the whole trend, uh, Zawadi, of how it went up to where we eventually had animation TV uh, warehouses online and on TV shows. And now the peak is coming back down again. And so there's a big opening, especially with this youth group and their love of technology, either through YouTube and the media, because the big uh, media conglomerates are dying now. Warner Brothers is going down the tube. Disney is just self-imploding. They tried to get too big, too fast, absorb too much, and not stay in their niche. And now they're looking for talent everywhere. So the timing is perfect for you to be thinking about these things and approaching some of these groups with some great ideas. And who knows what that can be, especially when we know that most of the major studio houses are in the big cities, your New York's, your L.A.'s, your Chicago's, your Miami's. What about folks like us who are creatives who live in North Carolina or live in rural Tennessee? And so the internet created this great big warehouse of equity. You didn't have to go. It's like book publishing your father now. When we were coming up and coming through, there was only a limited number of producers in limited areas you had to go through to get your book published. But uh-oh, here comes the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you can publish online and write, and you don't have to bend and them change your manuscript or whatever with your own unique voice and your talents even starting small because that's what uh henson did if you read his history he was doing commercials and he wanted to change his puppeteering and and that's how he launched into sesame street and from there kept building his platen of characters from kermit to miss piggy that ultimately led to the muppet show which ultimately led to independence and cable Fraggle Rock. And he just kept going from there. Unfortunately, he passed. But um, it shows you that there are folks out there. They're waiting for the next Henson, who may be this brother, you know, named Mutissi. Who knows? Mm. Right. And, and, and I, see, I see also the developing children books, the what is you talked about, you are in, both of you are in digital uh, technology and arts, and that's how you create books to teach, and that, and also entrepreneurs, then you sell them, and uh, as well as create, uh, teach kids to produce, and teachers to produce material, uh, uh, curriculum materials, and integrating that, uh, that uh, the the three D the dimension, the three D animations which we we often create a program. So that's where you bring you develop literacy, digital literacy, and engaging community, youth programs, kids, adults, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I know authors take a Nancy the Spider, who's been around. That is core to our people here, especially on the continent. If someone were to take that and just animate it and put it in a vehicle like that. Now people are going out and seeking the books, which gives new life to the author and the books. It's a whole new way of marketing. It's a whole new way of getting young people interested in reading. It's a whole new way of bringing life to characters and responsibly showing the truth of that character in their own vehicle, because we know that Hollywood will also often bend things to their own will, not necessarily for the good of the author or the character. And so that's a great way to think about that. And I can really see a lot of authors 
who may have some great books out there, great children's books, never thought, and, and you've already got the visuals and the art style in the book. I think about the great book I used to read to my second graders, uh, No Carrots for Harry. If someone were to animate that, or um, oh, what was the one on behavior? Oh, my gosh. Uh, there's so many of us out there. I remember my youngest son was crazy about uh, the, the black cat. Uh, oh, the black cat that just wouldn't do would do her own thing because she was taken from her mom as a kitten. Um, Kitty, uh, what was Kitty's name? Oh, goodness. Uh, it's a whole series of Kitty books. So that's just something to think about. Mm -hmm. So, you see that? Do you, you see uh, that Zawadi? You see how that can you can uh, engage yourself, start producing. Yes, yes. There's a good structure here. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I'm going to once again share my screen. Mm -hmm. Our next uh, key topic area is the what. So we got the who, you're addressing and rationale and need and partnerships and selling your expertise. And so we got the who all out the way. The what? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? So you have to be able to describe succinctly exactly what your project is going to be. So I give a, a, a sample project here that I call Read First. And in my Read First idea, I say Read First is a project that will offer academic enrichment and life skills training that expands students' knowledge, skills, and expertise. I could have added disposition in there through fully engaging in technical discipline related exposure to specialized reading content. Because it's Read First, it is a reading program. But the ideology is it's going to, along with reading that content and material, especially designed for these young people, you're going to give them academic enrichment because it's going to be a technically or technical or technological apprenticeship base. We used to have what we call the, uh, the VA, vocational education. And we had 4-H if you were a farmer. And we had uh, a masonry programs if you were going to build plumbing school and, and things like that. So you can become certified in those areas and gain expertise in those areas. But we're going to add that with reading content. We're going to do three hours a week from that. And we're going to have educational games that immerse you in the skills of that field. And it's all going to be discipline related. In addition, there's going to be life skills training. Again, that's the vocational part. And those are the things that people get excited about. They've been here. Training, technical, vocational, but they've been forgotten. And so Project Read First, yes, we want them to read more, but we want them to get skills out of it. So when we look at the what, there's five key areas typically in, that funders are looking for. They're looking for outreach, so how are you serving the community? How are you reaching out? In your intake of the persons that we talked about in the who, who are your population you're going to be working with, they want you to do some kind of comprehensive assessment, assessing them, showing why they need this particular program. Then they want you to talk about the program itself, the services you're going to give them. Is there going to be any follow-up to give them because Major funders like federal folks, every little while to make sure you're doing what you're doing, they want a report. And they want you to go to D.C. or whoever the funder is and tell them what achievements you made while you're doing this project, as the project is going on. And that's going to help you because sometimes it could be a small project and they want to fund it further because it's good. Oh, hit, a, hit one out the park like we did during an election year? Oh, man. They'll throw money at that thing like I don't know what. Governor Martin almost uh, uh, subsumed our program before he got pushed out as people wanted to change, and he was going to use it as his platform to run for governor again. So 
remember that the last thing they want is an evaluation, a judgment on how you did. So outreach, intake with a comprehensive assessment, services, what you're going to do, how you're going to follow, follow up, and lastly, how you're going to evaluate the program and the students and uh, if those, or rather the subjects who are a part of that. Let's talk about that a little bit so we stop sharing. Any thoughts about the what? Doc? You're muted. Right, right now, we have, when you look at community based development, we don't have, see institutions, community engagement, and then define solutions uh, which will engage youth to create. To, 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 to create jobs. It's, it's a dependence process. So in the, in the, to engage community, you have to look at the, assess the needs of the community. The youth are not connected and not engaged. The, um, the, the manufacturing uh, industry, for example, even trades like vocational training, like uh, uh, trades like, uh, excuse me, the, uh, we live in a in a in a place wow. where we the fire 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 trucks going by there all the time. The the for, for example, right now we have a, a need for plumbers, electricians, yeah, yes. uh, and the youth programs which employ uh, student uh, kid, uh, young young people learning and as they they earn. And that then to sustain community economic development for them, instead of going away to community, to stay in the community. Those are, those are ideas you need to start looking at and then put the package together. And then you, you, you have a, 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 a um, budget for it and then seek for funding where, where, where you can find to support the training. Workforce development today with vets, Hmm. But, but vets is there. Mental health is rampant in the community, schools, you know. You can provide all these services from the community base, not from university or schools. It's interesting because art has always been a way that has healed people. Yeah. And they're coming in full circle around back to that now. And there's yes. so many artists who could address that. But mm -hmm. want to hear from Zawadi. What would you be your what? What would you like to do? Um, definitely supporting the educational systems um, and or supporting education uh, to the, which also then trickles down to supporting all the jobs that are mentioned uh, before by my dad just just now with infrastructure and um, construction and and so I, I think that that plays a major part in attacking the source of of any issues within a community that you could support through what you're trying to fund. That's awesome because. When you make that rational statement, and that's a part of what you're doing, money's going to be thrown at you because people want to see that success, and they want healing, and they want the community to thrive. People don't want the community to die. And so when you can create that compelling piece and what you're doing and really rationalize it, oh, you stay relevant forever. Um, I remember the Shabazz's, Mahfouz family, uh, when he was born in Tanzania and they came over here and through African dance and then Chuck getting into it and other folks, it began to heal a lot of wounds in the community, but it helped over here build, even outside of our community, people really appreciating Africa and really appreciating the diversity, really beginning to appreciate the motherland. And that shifted everything and they did it through culture, through dance, through 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 food, through 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 the things that people normally would have been abrasive to or not even connect with. So that's powerful, awesome. Just think just more. think about think about it. Uh, it's an art. It's more of a, like literature of of uh, reflecting what's going on in the community, and animating that through stories through digital literacy through media, social media, having dialogue based whereby the youth the peers come together and discuss solutions where they've gone through. 
Yeah. And we have, we have a, like mental health is huge. And the only way you can do mental health is talking to each other and having mentoring uh, and, and the intervention skills. That is a, a big problem with our, uh, especially black community and low socioeconomic people because of stigma and yeah. the literacy around that and, and entrepreneurial think African people produce art as what they use, they, they eat, they smoke, they drink, they they live, and they, and they also that is creating uh, services that create revenue and activities which will raise revenue to sustain the dialogue and the communication to produce, be leaders and producers as opposed to consumers. Right now, you think of, oh, how oh, oh, can I get the best phone? Or oh, can I get the uh, the best toy? And the, uh, not the, how can I create the best toy? Mm -hmm. And how can I can I leverage the best toy using my creative or juices and art, which you already have, and, you, and the creating stories which capture and solve problems of social issues. Addressing what you're seeing, people are not seeing. And that's, important. that's important because a part of our people, everything is an art, mm -hmm. culinary art, the grill yes. singing history, mm -hmm. art, oration art, singing, the art of singing, harmony mm -hmm. with nature and the environment and art. Howard Gardner kind of touched on it with his multiple challenges, but he didn't really yeah. touch on it. Mm -hmm. Inventing a new solution is an art. Mm -hmm. Us having this dialogue and talking to one another is an art. Mm -hmm. Going tomorrow, you and I go swimming and, and, and swimming together and, and uh, cultivating that is an mm -hmm. art. So the athletic piece is an art. The art mm -hmm. part of us is indelibly connected to the very fiber of our being. Yes. And so there is no separation between it, how we worship our God, how we dialogue with one another. It's helped us to survive. For over 400 years here was our intelligence, creativity, ingenuity, but especially the art. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes healing when you begin to find solutions, conscientize a cow, name it, figure it out. And mm -hmm. then you begin to change that thing from what was a negative into a triple positive because mm -hmm. it's art. Mm -hmm. The art of communicating, the art of uh, 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 of of preparing food culinarily, the art of dialoguing in, in society coming together and airing out grievances. I've noticed since COVID, people are more prone to be combative mm -hmm. and be collaborative. And we have to reverse that stigma in that situation. And the key is being who we are through the art. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Let's keep going. So the big thing then with the funder wants to know is the win. Okay, how are you going to do this? When are you going to do it? How is it going to get done? That's down the line, but the win. The win, the win, the win. That's a, that goes into the money, how funds are allocated, and what you're going to do. But the proposal writer has to take ownership of the win. When you dictate the win, the money's going to follow. And there's a key thing that you use to do that. Like the who, you have to have a distinctive period that you're going to carry out the project. But you yourself should develop a timeline, <laughs> a model of how, see, Visual things attract people, much like the hieroglyphs, a visual language, because we're visual people, all of us. We see in pictures. We don't see in words. We don't see in songs. We, our, our, our ocular cavity, even our audio cavity, our smell, our taste, our, all, our five senses to our sixth sense are all connected and give us a holistic picture. Right. So when you create a project detailed timeline, 
where they can see highs and lows and when you're going to implement this, what the delivery style is going to be, what the outcome is going to be, what are significant milestones that are going to occur. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to get funded. I remember on the SAMHSA grant, I was frustrated at one point and I was working with another professor. And I went and I took Excel, I made a timeline out. It's crazy timeline. It showed all the things we were doing and how we were going to do it, what we were doing. I sent it in. And I got frustrated with the whole thing. I walked away from it. You don't want to hear about it. Done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My partner calls me up a couple months later and said, Hey, man, we got the money. The timeline was great. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, now I'm compelled to do this. Okay. In my head, yeah, okay, all right. I, I had totally put out my mind in mm -hmm. another direction. So having the detailed project timeline shows and shows that money's not wasted, what the deliverables, deliverables are going to be, it keeps you along a pattern. In this example, I give a three-year project timeline and what the outcomes are going to be. And so if you shoot for the stars, you're still in the heavens. So when reporting time's done, time gets done, you can talk about milestones you made, things you want to work on, things that are going good. It becomes like in uh, when they're doing software de design, instead of the old relay model, they use the scrum approach. You have these narrative and these stories that are going mm -hmm. on as you're going. And so you have the master timeline. Some things may get done ahead of schedule. Some things are falling in, some improvements. And when you can model that and it can be seen by funders, oh, they just love it. Because it shows that their money and their time has not been wasted. If I can inject that, you have to be, to develop thick skin or handle rejection. Because in the funding world, if it depends on how you, which which funder you are, uh, you are approaching, a lot of proposal grants, they you get rejection because there's only one proposal and the hundreds of people applying for. So some of them, they they, they just they are shelved. They, you have to understand the psychology of that. So I prepare to be rejected and re get by developing the resilience of and it dusting it off and sending it somewhere else if it's a well-developed proposal. And that way you get, you don't have to give up. And that's a, that's a, that's a, what trips a lot of, a lot of people uh, in a grant and a proposal when you are raising money from people and unless you're producing it yourself. One of my secrets that I'll tell you now that I've learned and getting funding um, with agencies, especially if you're going after agency funding now. So they always send out this request for proposals. If you have projects that you already have proposals for, and it doesn't matter if it's in the millions or small, mm -hmm. and you know it'll fit that area, but an award has not been given, and that timeline is coming down and they've got like a month turnaround to a week turnaround. And you know, you can take that proposal, dust it off, meet and just sculpt it to meet that area. Send it in the nth hour, bam, it's funded every time. It's amazing. And what I found out when I started talking to agencies is that people's necks are on the line with these proposals. And when there's a big one, similar to what Doc was saying, and everybody's after that money. Yeah, they can sit back and, oh, hodgy podgy what? But when that time gets down and nobody's applied, mm -hmm. folks next start getting on the chopping block federally. <laughs> and jobs can not be there. So you send this thing in the nth hour. What is this? Send them the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a tactic we learned what the SAMHSA grant was, wait. Let the RFP sit out there who's, oh, Tennessee's applied to the level man. Man, they didn't fail in Tennessee. How many more weeks? Oh, they got about 16 weeks. Oh, I don't worry about it. We'll come back to it. Anybody mm -hmm. been funded after eight weeks? Anybody been funded after four weeks? 
<laughs> okay, we'll get together and throw this thing together. Okay, it looks good. The ones we submitted early that look great, other people get to read your RFP, steal your ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I watched that happen with uh, communication disorders used to be in our building. Mm -hmm. University of Tennessee had nothing like Pablimos, mm -hmm. our, our bilingual communication disorders lab. They waited, and then um, our uh, vice chancellor of financial affairs didn't even submit the thing. They copied our proposal, mm -hmm. came and visited our school, saw him mm -hmm. limos, did a larger one of it, and got the money. <laughs> and they submitted it again the nth hour. Yes. And they had to fund them because they had nothing else out there. We would have easily gotten that grant. And mm -hmm. Raquel would still be employed with the university to this day. But... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's just the way it works. So we've heard from Dr. Matisse here. Your thoughts, Sawadi? Yes, I know that um scheduling can be quite difficult, but I, I like your approach, and, and I definitely will be reviewing <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this recording after this for sure. Thank you for, for having me part of this. Well, awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, and a it, lot of this strategy and tactics. You know, yeah. I stopped I stopped trying to be the eager beaver innovative guy, get mm -hmm. one innovative proposal, and I started studying these folks. And then I called, mm -hmm. you know, why did you fund this person? Why did you, oh, man, well, let me take him and talk off the record. You're not the news, are you? No, I'm not the news. I'm just a uh, small-time professor mm -hmm. now, trying to get mm -hmm. funded. Well, what happened was, man, you know, there was a change in the administration and whatnot, and a senator's wife, you know, was from Tennessee, really wanted this, and that was like, oh, okay, okay. So we send another one, y'all to look out, right? Now they ain't coming up front. Oh, yeah, 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 man, yeah. And so when you learn those insides, you say, oh, okay. <laughs> I see how you guys operate. Yeah. yeah. All right. Also, like, also, also, like, give me, a, give me a, a, a approval to share screen. And I show you something we've been sitting on it and doing nothing oh, about it. We just, oh, we just, you just, are. you just uh, brought these conversations, bring ideas. Okay, let the, me um hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. Let mm -hmm. me um hold on. Which I know. So why and hey, you're the host. Go ahead and share. And then Jaden can uh, do this easily. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. You remember this? I remember that. Oh, my God. Oh, man. <laughs> Already existing. And uh, let me see what I can play. You can hear. But now the audio is not coming through. Can you yeah, hear? No audio, Doc. Uh oh. But I remember that. I remember that. Oh, my yeah. God. You can hear you can you can you can hear? No, can't hear. Oh, how do I get to for you to hear? I have to mess around with audio settings, but just talk about it. Just talk about it. Yeah. So it, okay. This is uh, it, it's, it's uh, I have it in it. Oh wait a minute. Share your screen again. Okay. Uh it, it's Uh, I'm trying to stop it from talking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Take your time. Okay. This is the, uh, uh, let me go back here again and see what I can, you can see in the screen. This is a program I, I, oh. Okay. I'm, we can see uh, the screen. Yeah. Put, put it in the screen. Uh, it, it, yeah, it is, it has a, uh, it's a, it's a teaching language, learning to read. Uh -huh. literacy, literacy, which you can digitize, and we can teach any language today, it's Swahili to English, it's English, English it's, it's a second language, uh, and this is a, uh, it's, it's a program whereby it's already developed. We just need to convert this into, uh, 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 in, in, his, in Swahili, in, 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 in English as a program. This is English to Spanish instruction. Okay, now we, we, there's a need for Swahili in English and vice versa. And you have these uh, characters here, uh, which we, which, uh, yeah. 
Oh, I wish you could hear. I wish you could hear it. <laughs> now, I, remember, you, I remember it. I remember it. Now, this is something I have. I, I, oh, it's a web page. And we need to develop it in the learning management system and link it to and uh, enroll uh, uh, children, parents, and it's all, everything is all put together. I paid for it. It's for it cost forty nine dollars per, per subscription. In Sydney, I'm doing that. Wow! We can uh, we can see, actually we can do uh, create a similar series of language Swahili, for example. And the, and the, the, your your son you know, is in Zawadi, you can learn Swahili this way actually by creating this. So let's talk about when how we can convert this into learning management system and we can teach art as well yes we can teach uh, languages we can teach ai use how to use ai how to convert things oh, and, yeah. and, 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 and 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 the, and the so, so, solutions to app applications awesome yes this is it it's like what you're trying to do in youtube link it and then people use it and they take and create it a certificate when they completely have a test, yes. they can complete it. And I'm, this I'm, is a, a money money maker there. So the what I'm mean, sitting here paid for it, but it's nobody's doing anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> what you think about that, Zawadi? It's really great. Yeah, I'll, you can learn I'll a lot show you. I'll, I'll show you the link of, of my computer. If you once we finish, then you can you can you can uh, 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 come and uh, awesome. I had look, totally look forgot at, about that piece. You know, you do so much work sometimes, you just forget <laughs> about the, uh, yeah, you just, you just forget. yeah. Our next question the where, how are you going to deploy this thing? How are you going to implement it? Is it going to be online? Um, for example, here I had, uh, in the read first example, inner city of Durham, North Carolina, can be designated via the zip codes. 27701 27704 or whatever. You know, you just got to know where it's going to take place and mm -hmm. how it's going to be deployed. And when you accurately describe that, mm -hmm. it makes it much more appreciable by the funder. And mm -hmm. so we have mastered online teaching online. We have our own metrics and things of that nature that we want mm -hmm. to take higher. And so whether it's hybrid, online, face-to-face, self-driven, you just need to describe all of that. And we know that one of the large things that we did in the graduate program in EdTech was bring in an outside certifier and certify everybody in all courses. That mm -hmm. moved us huge on U.S. New World News and Report and uh, made us the number one EdTech program for years against mm -hmm. real heavy hitters. And they just could not figure out how two faculty members were outwitting them every, <laughs> every go around and they were blowing up our, our phones trying to find matching programs. But it quite simply was figuring out the where. Mm -hmm. Then we go into, uh, we talked about the who, uh, the why, the mm -hmm. rationale. Providing a compelling argument for why your project is doing what it's doing. Great rationales beat beautifully written proposals because it gives the funder the ability to argue and support what you're doing. So look at this: these six key questions in the center of this slide. Why are you targeting who you're targeting? Well, you kind of answer that early on with uh, the who, but you go further when you're looking at the why and providing a, a, a great decisionable argument that the funder can go back to their bosses and say, we funded this because of this. This expertise, this is the history, this is why, this is the need. Why have you decided on what you will do? How do you bring your expertise to bear and how will it change the lives and those around you? Why are you providing the services in to this particular place, which ties into the rationale? Is there a need? 
What need are you addressing? What are the expected outcomes? How are you going to do it? Again, going back to the timeline. Why are you deciding on particular times? So in one case, I give the example of an after-school program. Support for the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Support for the community. Why did you select this population? Is it based off need? Is it based off of interest? Are you addressing a deficit? Why does your expertise make you likely to serve the target population as well? You may be a part of that community or you have a vested interest. You may have seen things historically decline and you want to bring them back to the forefront. There may be opportunities for innovation and integration that nobody thought before. And so we developed the ideology of forget about the standards, innovate beyond the standards. So when we came under scrutiny to be recognized and reaccredited, they started in, in our discipline, we were under 26 different standards anyway. So it was always saying we were in a constant state of upgrading. It's just the way technology is. It's old when you get in the games. So we were always on the tip of the spear and the cutting edge. Whatever they were talking about now, we were looking five, 10 years ahead and implementing that now. So when they came to us, their minds were blown. They were like, man, we aren't even thinking this way. How are y'all coming up with this stuff? But to stay on the tip of the spear, you got to think about who you're targeting, what you're doing, staying on the cutting edge, always innovating because you want your students to go out and be, for us, gainfully employed and be leading the field. And so these are the thing, things to think about when you think about the why. Comments, Doc? That's exactly, you cannot even any anybody uh, doing work, planning anything, without articulating why you are doing it, then nobody would know why and they will appreciate it and you will never be able to design to, uh, to meet the, the need or the solution you need to produce. So the why is very critical. Even you have to know why you, you're doing that for, for who, what for, mm -hmm. when, yeah. where for, yeah. And they also how, which is the end, so you can figure out strategies and and to 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 have the it has to have value. The why is a value, and the vision uh, to, and the time which aligns with your mission. People are always talking about thinking out of the box, but they don't plan out of the box. Mm -mm. People are mm -mm. always talking about thinking out of the box, but they don't look out of the box. Yes. They get in the box and they don't want to think out of the box. No, 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 no. If you don't get in the box in the first place and you already have your business open to the infinite possibilities, you're always thinking outside of the box. And so new innovations fall at you flat at your feet every breath you take because your vision and your mission are entirely different than those that are around. It's like the allegory of the cave. The person leaves the cave and sees everything outside of it, comes back to the cave, and people in the cave want to kill them because they're so used to being stuck in that box. I never forget a friend of mine caught a huge turtle, giant snapping turtle was huge. Mm -hmm. Kept the snapping turtle inside his garage. Oh, the garage was foul smelling in the same giant tub, uh, trash can of water. Long time. Finally, his wife got fed up and her mom, they were like, you gotta get rid of this thing. He takes it back down to Jordan Lake, right where he for, for, followed it, found it. Poured it back in the water, and guess what the turtle did? Stayed in that mm. same little circle, so mm. in that same little area, and that same thing for it didn't even know it was free. Mm. And it stuck in that area of everything it was doing, and because it was a turtle, it could live off its own internal fat and whatnot in that mm. same water doing every it's turtle business. Yeah, yucky. So I smelled. And when it was poured and freed, it took Weather changes and everything because the thing was swimming in the circle. It, it was still doing the same thing. All the mm -hmm. food eventually, you know, it kept messing with it till it realized, oh, I'm free. Uh, let me go down here. Oh, I don't remember this place, you know. And so that's the danger of having a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. What's your thing, Zawadi?
Uh, yes, uh, the why is very crucial. Intention is is a very is truly okay. the source of of how successful you can be because intention is the you know the true catalyst behind um, how successful you can be. You know, if you if you think outside the box, it's great, but you got to get the groundwork going, just like you mentioned. And, and I I believe that um, the why is also uh, telling of what your motives are you know yeah and, and yeah. How, yeah. how far you can go with it mm -hmm. you can even hide. and that's awesome because uh we developed an in intentionality measure for ment mentoring your dad's mm -hmm. a great phenomenal mentor but the only one who can really tell you how well the mentoring went is the mentee mm -hmm. and so intentionality is a huge part of that yes. the rationale in your own head for why you're doing what you're doing and whether you're doing it out of conflict or you're doing it out of benevolence. Great mm -hmm. topic. Awesome, man. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's yes. keep going. So last we get to our last section, which is the how. And Doc mentioned that, and it's the key. Basically, the methodology and the implementation all coming together. Five basic areas, our last area of concern. How are you going to engage the target population? How are you going to assess them and admit them? How will you deploy and provide services? How are you going to retain your participants so they're getting an enriching experience? How do you evaluate ultimately in the end? We have two forms of evaluation, summatively um, formatively as it's going on and summatively at the end to know that you had a great outcome and it incorporates all of the previous elements but you should be able to summarize those things succinctly and be mm -hmm. able to explain those to funders and constituents and stakeholders so that you perpetuate what you're doing because the ideology of funding is not to do it one time. And for those who are a part to replicate the process in their own way. We want engagement for empowerment. We mm -hmm. don't want engagement just to improve a little thing and go on to the next big thing. We want live change. We want others to have their own visions and their own ideas. And that's how we keep this thing going. Your thoughts? That that's what you have a strategic plan. Yeah. And the strategic plan with the clear focus and the, the budget. Yes. The strategic plan is a budget, really. Really. And uh, which implements the ideas, the the goals, the objectives, and and it's you know making sure that you have a smart goals, and uh, understand what that means and how how to. Uh, scale scale up your plan yeah. To, yeah. to to produce the results you and replicate if necessary. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Zawadi, your thoughts? Uh, yes, there's so many different ways to um, achieve the how and and how to interact with others. So it's very crucial to organize that as, as much as possible at the start. So I, I do agree. Um, mm -hmm. the and organization with this part is very crucial. A lot of times, the how can lead to other organizations and new vistas of learning and things of this nature. It amazes me in academia. Yeah, I'm going to get on my, my horse. Okay, here we go, Doc. That <laughs> it cycles mm -hmm. its own growth. Mm -hmm. It rots its own self. Innovative institutions recognize, you know, faculty and student expertise is going to keep this thing going. We're going to and it amazes me how we sometimes go backwards instead of moving rectilinearly forward. And the how, as well as the why, and often it's personal benefit and things. But if we can keep the how and the why going and do all the other things and work collectively together, the outcome is always a blessing for the greater common good. I had to get that out. So I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> so this brings our fourth podcast episode to an end. 
and talking about the production and producing, sometimes your own, reading others, and looking at proposals. Go out, get you some proposals that have been funded, some good ones in your area, outside your area, read them. Contact agencies. Take a look at how those proposals were put together. Sometimes you can contact the people that wrote the proposals. Find out what their rationale and what they were thinking. What was the prevailing culture at the time? Were they successful? Did they deem it a success? The others deem it a success. And that will inspire you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. This yes. takes care of our fourth Triple O podcast. Take care. Be blessed and good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you guys came in. It was an awesome <laughs> podcast. This yeah. is what we recorded, Doc. <laughs> this is what we recorded. I and didn't mess send, up this time. <laughs> send, send it forward to Zawadi so he can review it. We'll do. Uh, we'll have it up on the YouTube uh, really, channel so you yep. guys can go out and take a yeah. look at it. Have yeah, a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.